Now, we're going to talk about Insurgentes. You've been making music for over 20 years. Why, why release a solo album now at this time? Um, well, because I think that over those 20 years, as you point out, there have been many aspects of my musical personality that have, I've expressed everything from you know ambient music to pop music to metal music. But I don't think I've ever done a project where um, all of those aspects were drawn together into a single musical statement before. So I suppose uh, Insecantis is an attempt to uh, encapsulate all of the various strands of my musical personality into a single album project. So it, it's the first time I can really say, you know, this is a complete picture of me as a musician and an artist. So, you know, it's not a coincidence. It's the first time I felt that I could actually put my own name uh, to something. How long has Insurgentes been in the making? Well, that's a difficult question to answer because, of course, there are ideas in here that, that have been fermenting in my mind for, for many years. Um, but at, in a more practical way, I would say that the album writing process started at, at the end of the last tour I did with my band Porcupine Tree, which was December last year. Uh, sorry, December 2007. And I kind of I wrapped it up around August, September. So it was about eight or nine months. But a lot of that was uh, traveling. And, and uh, you know, I did make the album quite a, an international experience. I wanted to enjoy the process. And I wanted to travel and, and meet other musicians and work with other musicians. So there was a lot of hanging out and fun involved as well. So you did it in several countries. Which ones were they? Uh, well, I was in um, Mexico City a lot, uh, Israel Scandinavia, Japan, uh, America, probably a couple of others I'm forgetting as well. It, w it was a real kind of road trip experience. And uh, tell us about some of the uh, musicians that you, the guest musicians that you had uh, working with you. The, yes, they're all, they're all people I've I've met over the last few years, and and many of them are friends of mine. It's nice to actually have the chance finally to collaborate with some of these people. For example, in Japan, I I met a couple of years ago. I met a fantastic experimental. Uh, music player called Michio Yagi who plays a traditional Japanese instrument called uh, a 17 string koto it's a wonderful sound very very kind of indigenous to Japan and and I met her and I heard her sound a couple of years ago and absolutely fell in love with the sound but obviously when you're in bands sometimes it's very difficult to you know to involve other musicians from outside of the group circle so one of the liberating things about making a solo record was being able to work with people like Michio for the first time. Who else do we have? We have a um, great British jazz musician called Theo Travis, who's been a friend of mine for many years on saxophone and flute. And uh, we have Tony Levin on, on bass on a couple of tracks from Peter Gabriel's band, who again is someone I've known for a few years, and it's great to have the opportunity to work with him. He's a real kind of legend. Gosh, who else do we have? Um, well, there's a few anyway. I noticed um, in the limited edition, in the photographs, there's a there's a picture of you and Robert Fripp. Does he appear on the album at all? Uh, no, there isn't a picture of me and Robert Fripp. Oh, someone who looks a lot like him. <laughs> uh, quite possibly someone who looks like him. I'm just trying to think who that would be. Robert won't allow anyone to photograph him, so... Oh, right. um, <laughs> I, I know who you're thinking of. Yes, the geezer with glasses. That's a guy called Colin Newman. He's a friend of mine. He's from a band called Wire. Have you ever heard of, uh, heard of a band called Wire? No, I haven't. Okay, they're an amazing British group from the 70s. Uh, I think that's probably who you think is Robert. It's, it's actually a guy called Colin. Colin Newman. A okay. Friend of mine. Well, speaking of that limited edition release, it was um, put out in November last year. Only 3,000 copies. I was fortunate enough to get one of them. Uh, were you surprised that it sold out so quickly? I was, yes. It actually, it was 4,000. Yeah, we... Um, it, it was a very difficult thing to judge because being my first solo record, I really didn't have any any precedent or way to judge how much demand there would be. And I've, I have been quite surprised by the demand and the interest in my solo record. Those particular special editions were extremely expensive to make. And if I'd made 10,000 and only sold 2000 I'd have been in a lot of trouble financially you know obviously so so I had I had to pick a number that I felt was realistic I had to pick a number that I felt was enough to satisfy the demand and I had to guess at the end of it I had to sort of you know take a shot in the dark and uh, I was wrong <laughs> but um, 
you know, I'm happy that I did it. I think it's a, a very beautiful thing. And, you know, there's 4,000 copies out there and, and 4,000 p- collector's pieces. And It's got pride of place on my bookcase at the moment, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's something really for people who cherish a beautiful piece of art, you know, in relation to music. And I, I certainly love those kind of things too. So it's a shame I didn't know I could have done more and, and given people, more people the opportunity. But, you know, hindsight is a, is a wonderful thing, isn't it? It is. How do you feel about the uh, the highly inflated prices people are selling them for on eBay? Well, that that's upsetting. You know, I, I was very unhappy when I saw that, but you know, it's, I only have myself to blame. I, I'm I'm very aware that there are people out there who are aware of of the value of the, the collectability of some of my releases, and particularly the limited releases, and and do kind of take advantage of that. But on the other hand, the the the, the four thousand copies they were available to buy for a good you know a good month. And people that missed out, I don't know what they were doing, maybe on vacation for a month or whatever. Or Everyone had the chance to get one, is what I'm saying. So I don't feel, you know, that, every, that I didn't give everyone a chance to get the special edition. But, you know, there will always be people who would take advantage of the collectability of, of items like this. I, I can't do anything about that, really. I could never have made it an unlimited thing. It, it was so expensive to make that it, yeah. it had to be limited, however, however I did it, you know. Uh, my co-host is, uh, is is looking at me through the window. He was on holidays when that was released for about six uh, weeks over in Europe, so he okay. missed out. Now, the, the video clip for Harmony Corrine, it's it's an amazing visual feast by Lassa Hoyler. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah, that's um, correct. Yeah. How, how did your associa- association with Lassa come about? And um, tell us about his forthcoming film, the documentary in Sir Gentes. Well, I, I met Lassa when he contributed some artwork for for Porcupine Tree uh, about five, six years ago. He did uh, he did some pictures, one of which we ended up using on the front cover of an album called In Absentia. And I, so I, I kind of started to develop a creative relationship with him. And he's someone that, he's very, he's very um, important to me because I think in your lifetime as an artist, you, you only ever expect to meet someone that's completely on the same wavelength as you. Maybe two or three times in your life, you know, someone that really has a, you have a very empathetic relationship with. And Lasser is one of those people because I, I can, I always think of my music in visual terms anyway. I'm, I'm very inspired by cinema and cinema informs a lot of the, the music that I make. So to have a collaborator who is very technically gifted and very imaginative when it comes to visuals and someone that I can explain to him say a song idea or a lyric idea or an idea I have he will go away and he'll come back with something and show it to me and I'll say I'll look at it and I'll say yes that's exactly exactly what I imagined and that kind of relationship is very very rare where you can explain something to someone and you know implicitly know that that person totally understands exactly where you're coming from so i wanted lassa to be involved from the beginning of this project because for many years now i've been thinking about doing some kind of film project and and i've actually tried to get various film projects off the ground i even wrote a script a few years ago with a friend of mine and it's very hard to get a movie project off the ground so i thought well the, the one movie i know i can get off the ground is a movie about me about my life as a musician and about the making of this record so I said to Lassa, why don't you just travel with me? So he was with me the whole time, you know, when we were traveling to all these different countries. He was there, he was filming, he was photographing. And we kind of conceived the idea to do this multimedia project with a with a photographic book, a film, and, and the album as well. So it, it, the movie is not just about me, I hasten to add. It. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of more like a travelogue or a road movie. It has many other musicians in it talking about how their careers have been affected by you know the changes in the music industry over the last few years so it's almost like a document of what it what it is to be a musician in in this day and age which i think is a very kind of a traumatic age for you know for being a musician we're we're kind of we're we're at the cusp of a of a very seismic change in the whole way that people think about music and relate to music and experience music so in a way i wanted to kind of document that that period with this album and, and the film. Some of the clips that I've seen on the internet seem to display almost a hatred you have of iPods and that kind of technology. Well, the, the iPod for me is a symbol. It, it's it's symbolic. It, obviously, you know, technology, there's, 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 no, there's nothing implicitly wrong with technology in itself. It's how people 
choose to use it. Um, the iPod for me is symbolic of the way that people's relationship with music has changed over the last few years. Now, in some respects, the iPod is great because more people are listening to more music than ever before because of the convenience of the iPod. But the downside is the way that the iPod does continue to erode what I think are the best qualities of music as an art form, which are the album as an art form. In other words, listening to a a musical adventure from beginning to end, the way the artist intended you to listen to it. Now, the iPod kind of promotes more the kind of shuffle or playlist mentality. So I'm not sure people are actually listening to albums anymore. Um, the second thing is it takes away the, the importance of artwork uh, and presentation, which I've always felt was an extension of, of the musician's creative process. So it's not hard to see from my special edition how much I value uh, presentation and artwork. And I think a lot of people still do. And the third thing I don't like about the iPod is the um, the quality of experience is quite low. Um, I mean, an MP3 is a very compressed piece of audio. It's a, it's a, it's like a poor photocopy of of a, a beautifully produced piece of art. For me, the, the best metaphor is the difference between going to see a beautiful painting in an art gallery. And then taking a, showing someone a photocopy of, of the painting, you know. You can still appreciate it's a great painting, but the quality of experience is so much lower. And I feel that way with MP3s and listening to these MP3s on these horrible little headphones that people wear, you know, on the bus and the train with all the ambient noise and all this stuff. To me, there's no substitute for still listening to a great piece of music at the highest possible resolution on a great stereo and, and looking through the artwork as you do so. That, I know that's a kind of old-fashioned and perhaps over-romantic way of looking at it, but I still believe that that's, you know, that's the ultimate way to experience this art form. You mentioned Porcupine Tree uh, throughout our discussion. Um, it's been going 20 years this year since you released that first cassette, Tarquin Seaweed Farm. How, how, yes, uh, I guess it has, yeah. How did Porcupine Tree begin? It began in my bedroom uh, when I was still at school, and it began because I couldn't find any musicians uh, in my local town that wanted to play the kind of music I wanted to play. And you have to understand that the, the period we're talking about here, which is the kind of late 80s, um, was not a great time for creative music. This is before the, before the great revolution of the 90s where you could start to make music with, with home recording technology and you could experiment at home and, and be innovative and all that stuff without having to have record deals and those kind of things. In the 80s, you still really had to have a record deal if you wanted to make records. So I, I went a different route and, and I wanted to make very different music. I loved 60s and 70s music and I wasn't interested in being in the kind of bands that everyone wanted to be in at the time, which were you know bands like U2 and Simple Minds, all those kind of 80s bands. I wanted to make music that was more inspired by experimental rock, psychedelic music, rock, um, progressive music, crowd rock music. So I, I was very fortunate. I had a father who was an electronic genius, and he built me home recording uh, stuff, you know, home recording machines and echo machines and primitive synthesizers and stuff. And I was able to experiment with multi-track recording and, and, and learning how to overdub and learning how to produce from a very early age. And that was really the genesis of, of, of the first Porcupine Tree music. But how are okay. things progressing with the new Porcupine Tree album? Uh, and can we expect another Australian tour very soon? Well, the first question, things are going great. I've just finished writing it, and we start recording in, on, in two weeks. On the 15th, actually, we start recording, less than two weeks. And the album is already scheduled for September uh, release by the record company. So, yes, absolutely, we'll be back to Australia. Really enjoyed the, sh the shows we did there and uh, had a great time. So uh, definitely now we'll be, we'll be part of our regular touring itinerary, no question. That's no great question. to hear. We'll be there. Um, all the best for Insurgentes. Hi, this is Stephen Wilson from Porcupine Tree, and you're listening to Edge Radio. Enjoy. Uh, I just heard you talking about um, the iPod uh, and how people do like the artwork. I'm a little bit like you, uh, that I'm, I'm right into the old vinyl because of the 12-inch artwork that comes along with it. Mm. 
have you got any plans to come down to Australia again to to do another tour here? Well, as I was saying to Dwayne, uh, um, it will definitely be part of of the itinerary for the band next time we make a record. Um, I'm not sure if I'm if I'm going to tour my solo record yet, but if I do, maybe then I would like to come there too. But if all else fails, um, Porcupine Tree will definitely be back. Um, probably towards the end of the year I think because the album will be released in September so we'll be touring from, from sort of late September onwards I would think and I must say Sorry. that my favourite track at the moment is Dark Matter ok I mean what an amazing track, how did you conceive a song like that I mean that's, that's probably a silly question um, gosh I don't remember to be honest I mean I have a very, I have a very ambivalent relationship with my, you know, with my back catalogue I don't. I don't remember. I, mean, I don't listen to my old records. I don't remember. You know, I'm always, I'm always very much focused on what I'm doing now. You understand? So, dark matter. Who knows? I don't know where it came from. It's yeah. a very old song now. Ninety-seven, yeah. uh, ninety. Yeah, but it's got such a lovely feel to it, you know, and it just mm. bursts out into this amazing guitar solo, which I'm mm-hmm. quite accustomed to by now when I listen to a lot of your music, and that's one okay. of the highlights I'm always listening out to, you know, just when you burst out into another great guitar solo. The one thing that I do admire about you as well is that you that you don't restrict yourself to the two or three minute song formula, but that you actually burst out, you know, and 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 that you take the risk and the chance to actually play some long pieces, just oh, for sure, yeah, just in the old tradition, yeah, of of all the prog rock, you know. No, no, it's quite amazing. 